you. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. I appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, Toadstool offering me this opportunity. I want to urge folks to be sure to support their independent booksellers. Uh, so we have, a, we have a small fan club here tonight. We have uh, my good friend Don Garfinkel, who lives over in Wallingford. We have my mom and dad, which I'm glad to see you here. And Mary, it's, uh, although I can't see any of you, I can only, uh, uh, I can see your names. It's great to have you here, Mary. Um, it's nice to, nice to have you with us. Uh, because we're a small group tonight, I will um, probably not deliver the entire uh, uh, package that I had planned because uh, particularly Don and, and my folks have heard this before, but this is being recorded for Toadstool's uh, website. And so I do want to offer up uh, uh, some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you this evening. And um, so I want to start, first of all, by saying that, that I've been um, up in the in the Keene area for much of the summer. Our daughter lives in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. We just got back having celebrated the arrival of our fourth grandchild, uh, another grandson. And we are so delighted to have Benjamin with us in the world. And uh, it is such a pleasure to be up in the environments where Toadstool is located and Toadstool in Keene and Toadstool in Peterborough. Uh, so it's been a fun time for us, although a pretty, pretty wet summer up that way. So, um, uh, that, that really takes me to, to just a little bit of personal background stuff I wanted to share with people. And I'll start by saying that, that I really am a New Englander at heart. I, I live in Pennsylvania now in suburban Philadelphia, but New England is still very much home to me. My wife and I, uh, Irene and I moved to Pennsylvania in 2006 after having spent um, more than 20 years in the Portland area, Portland, Maine area. And um, we like to get back up there as, as often as we can because we have family in New Hampshire and friends in Maine. And so New England really calls to me and speaks to me. And, and uh, if you have read the book, you know that, that Southern Maine, the geography of Southern Maine plays a large role in this story. And so um, they say that writers should write what they know and, and the environments of Southern Maine was something very familiar to me and it felt very comfortable to place this story in that location. That said, um, I will also say that, that um, uh, I spent all that time in Southern Maine in the Portland area working as an attorney. Uh, that was for almost 18 years. I practiced law in Portland, both in private practice and in a, um, uh, in a corporate environment. So I am now a Unitarian Universalist church pastor I went to seminary back in 2002 and was ordained to the ministry in 2006. And the reason we moved out of New England is because a church here in Media, Pennsylvania called me to be their pastor. And I have been serving that congregation uh, since that time. And it, that has been a source of great joy for me. So it's sort of a circuitous path to go from being a lawyer to, to being a church pastor to being, a, being an author. And um, I think the thread that runs through all of that is really the thread of writing, uh, writing for different reasons, whether it was writing college papers and law school papers, writing uh, legal briefs, all that type of thing, writing sermons now as a pastor. I've always enjoyed writing. Um, it's been a source of, of uh, fulfillment for me. Writing comes fairly easily to me, which um, uh, if you had seen the first draft of this story, which was uh, gargantuan, it was 140, 150,000 words. Uh, I just kept writing and the story kept going and uh, uh, it just took on a life of its own. So the, the writing piece um, has been something consistent throughout my life. And, um, but the creative writing is new, it's relatively new. And I think my first foray into creative writing really was with poetry. And um, that dates back probably six or seven years ago, maybe longer now, <clears throat> where I, I began to write poems that were related to the um, topics that we were, we were reflecting on in church. And so instead of writing a monthly newsletter column on whatever topics of the day there were, I started to write poems. And I really enjoyed that, that different type of um, of writing process and the the creativity of it, the openness of it, the the um, the um, kind of expansiveness that came with creative writing, 
And, uh, and so I, I was writing poetry for several years before I started writing this book. And, um, but I'd never written, I'd never written a long form of fiction. I'd never, never taken on a project like this with my writing. So this was, this writing this book was all new to me. I've never taken a creative writing class. I've, I've, not, I've not been professionally trained. I'm really flying by the seat of my pants through this whole process. Um, but, but I found that through the process, what I enjoyed most about writing this book was, was that, that creative aspect. I, I did not plan out the plot of this book in advance. I did not know where it was going to end up. I didn't know what was going to happen to the two main characters, Catherine and Nathan, after the tragedy that they suffered. And what, what really was most gratifying through this process was the surprises that would arise and how the plot would take a turn here or take a turn there. New characters would show up that, that the main characters would have to interact with. And, um, and so that, that process that, that enabled me to just follow um, where the story wanted to go was really enjoyable. Uh, which is a good thing because it, this has been a journey of about over four years for me to get this book from the place where I <clears throat> first started writing to where I, we are today with a, actually a published novel. And it's kind of strange to say so, but I did not actually set out to write a novel. And um, uh, my friend Don, who's on this call, can attest to this. It's, it's Don, Don is a running partner of mine and he, he spent... He, hours and hours and hours hearing me agonize over this story. But um, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't sit down to write a novel when I started writing this. So let me give you just a little bit of background and tell you how this, this story came to be. Um, it all started with a nightmare that I had. And the nightmare involved um, my two grandchildren at the time um, being, um, uh, on a journey with their dad in an SUV and they, uh, not an SUV, an ATV. And they uh, crossed a, a pond where the ice wasn't too uh, thick. And in my nightmare, the, the kids drowned. And that is of course the precipitating event of this novel. I'm not giving away any major plot points. You'll find that out if you haven't read it. It's within the first 50 pages. This terrible, terrible tragedy that happened. And I, so I woke up from this nightmare. And the first thing I did is I went to my son-in-law and I said, you have to promise me you're never going to drive your, S, your ATV across the ice with the kids in it. And, um, and he has not done that uh, since I requested that. He respected that wish. But I had this nightmare and it just stuck with me. I couldn't shake, shake it. Um, and of course, it, the terrible, terrible tragedy that, that as we all know, when you have a dream or a nightmare, it seems very real. And, and, um, and so I, I was just thinking about it constantly for about a month. And finally, I thought to myself, well, maybe if I just put it down on paper, if I write it out, what, what had happened, Maybe that'll just get it out of my head, get it out of my body, and it'll sort of free me from, from the impact of the nightmare. So that's what I did. I sat down and I started writing it as if it were a, a story. Um, and and that I went from that to thinking, well, what would happen to a couple where this happened to them, where they suffered this terrible tragedy? And that led me down the path of, uh, that has, has led me to where we are today and having this book. So um, uh, the, the, the event itself, I don't think is particularly important to the story in the sense that it's a, it, it could have been any kind of tragedy that happened to these two people, any kind of trauma. There is, a, I think, a universality to to tragedy that, that as a human condition that we can all relate to. But this particular event, certainly if you're a parent, uh, something like this happening to your children is about the worst thing you can possibly imagine. But the book itself is really for me a vehicle of um, examining how we uh, work through our grief after trauma, how we find a place of, of um, reconciliation and hope if, if that's possible eventually. Um, and, um, and then because in this particular story, 
the husband, Nathan, has some culpability for causing this horrible accident, there's this very complex layering on. Um, uh, in addition to the grief, we have this issue around um, blame and forgiveness. And so Catherine and Nathan, our two protagonists, the husband and wife, um, go on this journey uh, around recovery, experiencing their grief, recovering hopefully from their grief, um, and, and then the idea of, can you actually forgive someone for something that is so horrendous, so terrible? It, is it possible to reach a place of forgiveness? So those are the topics that I, I really sought to explore in this novel. Um, um, I've, been, I've been accused of writing a, 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 a dreadful, heavy, uh, uh, sad piece, but I think ultimately it, it is a piece about hope. I think that, that um, we follow Catherine and Nathan through their grieving process to where they are creating new identities for themselves and coming to new ways of looking at both themselves and the world and, uh, and moving forward because we all, after, after suffering tragedy, we have a choice of, of either staying stuck in our, in our grief, um, maybe not dealing with it, maybe denying it, um, or we can integrate that experience and that grief into who we are and who we eventually become. And so these are all the topics that I, I've sought to explore in this, um, in this story, hopefully in a way that, that um, engages readers and, and keeps you interested and, and uh, makes, you wanna, makes you wanna keep reading. So um, uh, in a few minutes, I'm gonna read a couple of, of chapters from the book and then we'll have a chance to open it up for questions and answers. But um, I want to go back just briefly for a moment and talk about um, um, about this element of surprise and about my my writing process itself for just a moment, because um, it really the genesis for that surprise. Oh, I can see Mary now. Hi, Mary. Um, uh, the the genesis for that process really was in through my sermon writing, and I, I uh, am uh, I owe a debt of gratitude to my congregation for this because when I first started serving this church and I was writing a sermon every week, I was very determined to end up in a certain place. So I would write so that the, so that the sermon would end up with a given message. And I found after about a year or a year and a half of writing sermons that way, it was very um, constricting. And so what I started to do, what I started to do was to trust that that I had something to say that would be of value to someone. And so I would start writing a sermon with an idea of where I wanted to end up, but I would let the sermon go where it seemed to want to go. And, um, and that became sort of my, my um, the way I wrote my sermons. And that is very much the way I wrote this novel. And um, uh, I, I, once I saw that I was writing a novel, I didn't know exactly how it was going to turn out. And I just trusted that it would turn out in a way that um, provided some, some meaning um, and some, some interest to people. So that was my um, uh, sort of the, my approach. And um, one, of the, one of the questions that, that I often get asked is, um, well, how do you, how, how do you full-time serve a parish and write a novel. And, uh, as, uh, as some of those of you on the call know, I am uh, not a very good sleeper. So I, I oftentimes am up at 4.30 in the morning writing. And, um, uh, and then I would also schedule two blocks of time uh, out each week uh, where I would write. So I, I would put on my calendar, just like any other appointment, writing. And I would try to treat that as an appointment and I would sit down and write during those blocks of time. And then the, the third piece was just being able to take a, uh, get a good chunk of time off in the summer in July. I, um, I have the month of July basically off and so I'm able to, to spend some time uh, that way as well. So let me just take a quick look at my notes and see what I might be, what I might be missing here. Um, yeah, I think that's, those are sort of where I, what I wanted to give you in, in the way of background. Um, I do wanna speak to, for a moment about grief and loss 
because we are as a nation, as a world right now, suffering through this tremendous communal tragedy and trauma. And clearly four years ago, I did not set out to write a, a novel that was going to be about grief and loss and tragedy and trauma, uh, thinking that there would be, uh, that we would all be in this position at this point. But I think that, that um, for me, there is some value to reading this story during this time, because as I said earlier, the, the story is ultimately a story of hope. And I think that, that um, uh, eventually we get to that place of hope. And um, it also informs us about how we grieve. And we see two characters, Nathan and, and Catherine, who grieve in very different ways and who process their grief in very different ways. And what we learn hopefully in this story or what we're reminded of is that there is no one correct way to grieve or to recover from a tragedy or a trauma. That we each will be on our own journeys, that we each need support on those journeys. Neither Catherine nor Nathan do this on their own. Uh, Catherine has the help of a, shockingly, a UU minister, a Unitarian Universalist minister. And um, Nathan has the help of a therapist. So they are in community, they're in relationship as they process and work through their grief. Um, but the, the whole idea that there are stages of grief and that it's a set process that everyone goes through, um, this story reminds us that that's not the case. And that um, I think that right now, as we are grieving, whatever losses we are grieving through this trauma of, our, of the pandemic, whether that's a loss of a loved one, loss of relationship and connection, loss of a job. Um, we're all suffering in different ways and grieving in different ways uh, right now. And, um, and however we're processing that grief, if we are processing it and dealing with it, um, it's a very much an individual thing. So I think that's a message that I hope comes through the book and, um, and that it sort of gives permission to people to experience grief in their, in their own way. So I would also, I'd like now if, uh, let's see if we have time. So 6.20, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, read a couple of short um, passages from, from the book itself. I'm not going to um, read passages that really give away any of the plot line because hopefully you'll read the book and, and you'll be able to uh, see where it goes. But I am, I wanna give you just sort of a sense of how, my, how I write, what my writing style is like, how it flows. Um, this, this, these two sections, I, the book is written alternatively by chapter from the perspective of Nathan and Catherine. So I'm gonna read a little bit from Nathan's perspective and then I'm gonna read a little bit from Catherine's perspective. And these two excerpts take place about a year after the tragedy itself, after the death of the children. Um, and, um, and so let me read you first from a chapter from Nathan's perspective. Nathan had forgotten the effect that clear mountain air had on him. It had been years before he'd even met Catherine since he'd hiked in the White Mountains of northern New Hampshire. His first exposure to these peaks had come as a boy when he attended a summer camp on Squam Lake. He had signed up for an overnight hike up to the Lake of the Clouds hut, an iconic shelter perched on the broad shoulder of Mount Washington. For a 12-year-old boy, the hike up the Amanusik Ravine Trail had been strenuous, but he'd had youth on his side and the counselors had let them stop and cool off in the pools below the many waterfalls that cascaded off the side of the mountain. To this day, Nathan still recalled the moment they'd broken out above treeline when he had gazed down on the valley floor spread out below and up at the vast sky spread out above. He had spotted a hawk making long, slow circles just about at eye level, and he felt the pull of the air. It was as though he'd found a kindred spirit, that in a past life he had himself been a bird of prey, an animal capable of soaring for hours on invisible currents of air. It was the first inkling he'd ever had that there might be something bigger than his own small and comfortable world some greater stream of time that he was a part of 
that flowed long before he'd been born and would keep flowing long after he was gone. Now, more than two decades later, Nathan was scaling the steep and treacherous Lionhead Trail up the spine of Mount Washington out of Pinkham Notch. His pack with three days worth of gear felt light on his back and the summer day was hot, but not stifling. This was his favorite trail to the top of New England's tallest peak because it gained altitude quickly and was the shortest route to get above tree line. Huntington Ravine fell away to his right and to his left the famed Tuckerman Ravine with its headwall that tested the mettle of the world's best skiers every spring. He noticed that there was still snow down in Tuckerman's and he felt a pang of regret that he'd never taken on the headwall when his legs were younger and stronger than they were now when he spent so much of his time sitting at a desk. That lost opportunity glanced off him like a flat stone skimming across a still pond. Nathan acknowledged it and let it go. Robert, Nathan's therapist, had been working with Nathan on the topic of regret and the vice-like grip it had on him since the accident. How can I not regret my decision to take the shortcut across the ice? Nathan and his therapist had shifted the locale of the therapy session to the wraparound porch of the Victorian that housed Robert's office. They sat facing the river as the late afternoon sun dappled the water. It was the worst decision of my life. I'm not saying that you can let go of regret entirely, Nathan. What I'd like to do is see if we can help regret let go of you. Nathan turned and gave Robert a look that conveyed his skepticism. What I mean is we all have regrets. We mourn miss opportunities, things we did or didn't do. The question is how much or to what extent we let them control our lives. Some people are so controlled by regret that they're unable to make decisions for fear they'll be wrong, that they'll make more mistakes. They're paralyzed by their regrets and the possibility of piling on more. I'm not sure how that's playing out for me, Nathan said. Well, let's see. What have you done lately that feels a little risky? Where have you stretched yourself? When have you taken a chance since the accident? Nathan reflected on Robert's question as he listened to the river tumble over the dam that lay just upstream from where they sat. Robins hopped around the yard, cocking their heads to listen for worms wriggling below the surface. As he considered his answer, Nathan came up empty handed. He realized that he'd done nothing since the accident that would fall into the category of risky behavior. And not just with taking physical risks like going rock climbing. Nathan saw that in his work, he had become risk averse in his financial advising, steering clients towards stable and conservative investments, even when some had expressed a willingness to roll the dice a bit. I've been playing it really safe ever since the accident, haven't I, Doc? You tell me, Nathan. I mean, it makes sense, right? The last time I took a chance, look what happened. Even though I did everything I could to keep things safe, it all blew up in my face. I wish I'd never done it and I'll regret my decision until my dying day. Can you blame me for not wanting to do it again? Of course, I don't blame you, Nathan. I don't blame you for anything. See, a healthy sense of regret helps us to grow. It's how we learn from our mistakes. But I think it's important to see how and where regret might be adversely affecting you, maybe even holding you back. Nathan contemplated that conversation as he continued his ascent toward the summit. So as I mentioned before, Nathan and Catherine are going through and processing their own grief in their own way. They are um, working in parallel and sometimes intersecting opportunities to do that. So this next section is from Catherine's perspective. And it's at about in the same time frame in the in the story. With the early sunrises and nearly endless twilights of Maine in midsummer, Catherine felt drawn to the outdoors. She began to spend more time in the yard making lazy circuits around the house. In that grace-filled hour before sunrise, when the earth still held the nighttime's coolness, she would even explore the path that led into the forest, listening to the world awaken.
but she never ventured far from the edge of the yard, always keeping her escape route clear. The deeper parts of the forest still felt threatening to her. These trees, after all, had consumed her children. But her trips to the edge of her comfort zone had their own rewards. They reminded her of her childhood when she and her sister Carrie would walk out the back door of their home and into the woods for all sorts of adventures. They also reminded Catherine of how much she had enjoyed riding Annie along the trails and streams of her childhood. The muscles in her body held the memory of sitting astride her beloved horse, the pressure of her thighs against the saddle, urging the animal forward, the wind in her face, the freedom of gliding through the trees. Maybe, she thought during one of her walks, this is a part of my past that I can resurrect and reclaim. A quick search of the web revealed a barn that boarded horses in Limerick, just a few miles north of Newfield. As she pulled off the road and onto the long driveway that led up to Sunnybrook Farm, seeing horses grazing in the fields on either side, Catherine felt the inexorable pull of the place and the longing to love one of these beautiful beasts as she had Annie. Catherine and Penny, a copper colored eight-year-old mare, hit it off immediately. Penny nuzzled Catherine playfully whenever she showed up at the stable and Catherine could lose herself gazing into Penny's chocolate colored eyes. She loved everything about riding. She loved the physicality of it, the way horse and rider communicated through their muscles without a word spoken. There was a primal relationship that Catherine experienced whenever she was astride the horse, not just between a human and a beast of burden, but between two living, breathing animals of different species, working together as one, bringing satisfaction to both. Penny needed to be ridden just as much as Catherine needed to ride. After her first time on Penny, when she found that they were a good match, Catherine signed up to ride her twice a week. It was a Tuesday afternoon, a day like so many others, when Catherine found herself standing in front of Penny's stall. Hey there, girl, want to get out on the trail today? She grabbed the halter and gently placed the bit in Penny's mouth, Penny accepting it willingly. Rubbing the horse's silky flanks as she walked around her, Catherine took the saddle blanket and saddle off the rack and hefted them onto Penny's back. She noticed that the horse was standing with one of her rear hooves on tiptoe, a sign of ease and contentment that Catherine translated as trust. You're such a sweet girl. She cinched the girth tight around Penny's belly and led her out of the stall and into the late summer sunlight. The mare tossed her head twice as if inviting Catherine to mount her so that they could get going. The rider ob obliged and soon they were out beyond the paddock and into the vast fields that made up Sunnybrook Farm. Catherine, kept Penny at a walk at first, the two of them getting reacquainted. Catherine could sense when the horse wanted to stretch her legs, so with a squeeze of her thighs and a slight lean forward in the saddle, she gave Penny the signal to move first into a trot and then a canter. When they reached the edge of the field, Penny led them onto a trail between the trees that took them into the adjacent forest. Catherine trusted the horse and gave her free rein to go where she wished. The trees were sparse here, and Catherine found the woods to be inviting rather than threatening. They were filled with sunshine streaming down between branches, and the light had an almost magical quality to it. Sensing her rider's ease, Penny picked up her gait, and soon the two of them, working as one, were flying along the trail. Pure joy coursed through Catherine's veins, and a wide smile broke out on her face, stretching my muscles that had been dormant for months. She realized that she hadn't smiled since the accident. Penny was in full gallop now, yet her stride was effortless. Horse and rider were weightless, sliding between trees that passed by in a blur. They were one organism breathing together, their hearts beating in sync with each other. They were like two streams that merged into a powerful river flowing as one through the forest. Astride Penny, Catherine felt free for the first time since, since when, she wondered, certainly since the accident, but maybe since before she'd become a mother, since before she'd become a wife, since even before she'd met Nathan for the first time. 
As she urged Penny onward, they were racing now. It was as if a spell she'd been under for years was breaking beneath her, falling away, being left behind her like a boat's wake that is kicked up then settles and dissolves with both time and distance. So that's just a, an example of the, of the writing. I, I, I hope uh, you enjoy that. And um, I think now I'm going to open it up for questions. Does any of you have, have any questions for me? You can unmute yourself and, and fire away. Hi. Um, have you found in your pastoral experience that loss of a child often results in the breakup of a marriage? I've heard that that happens even if there's no blame to assign. I think, uh, thanks for the question, Mary. Um, it, it, I think statistically that is true. It does often happen. It doesn't always or need, it doesn't necessarily need to happen, but it is a frequent result of the loss of a child. Yes, absolutely. And my other question was, in your experience, is the indictment and the conviction and the trial something that often happens when blame could be assigned to the loss of children? Or is this just an overzealous prosecutor that comes into the plot <laughs> and adds extra drama? <laughs> Uh, well, I do think that that uh, we're we're looking at an overzealous prosecutor in this story. That's for sure. Um, but I do think legally that if you define uh, the the legal definition um, of manslaughter, it could lead to this sort of prosecution for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I would say we don't want to give away too many plot points for those who are listening uh, who haven't read the book. So, <laughs> but that's okay. Not a problem, Mary. Not no no worries. Um, other other questions? Sure. Um, can you just speak to some of the challenges that you encountered with writing a novel versus some of the other forms of writing that you'd engaged in in the past? Thank you, Grace. Uh, I think the one of the biggest challenges was was getting it um, to the place of publication, and um, um, and certainly sticking with a project that that took four years to complete. It takes a lot of um, um, perseverance to do that. Uh, you know, I can write a poem and put it on the web and it's done and, and you know, it could be in 15 minutes or, or three hours. And uh, so there were a lot of times in this process where I thought the, I was at the end of the line and whether it was um, uh, after I, you know, was trying to find an agent for over a year um, unsuccessfully and then uh, once when I did finally find an agent and then that didn't work out and, and I didn't have an agent, um, that, that was a kind of a devastating blow. And my, my attitude for this whole project was, let's just see how far I can take it. So I, after the first draft is like, okay, I've got a first draft of a novel, uh, what do I do next? And so um, it was a process of constant learning and also reaching points that felt like um, they, it could be the, the end and then thinking, well, how do we move beyond that? And I want to give credit to Don Garfinkel, who's on this call, uh, for helping me get through a lot of those hurdles. His, it was his encouragement um, uh, and having read a couple of the drafts to, to say, well, you, you really need to keep going, keep trying to figure this out. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough process. And I'm very grateful to Atmosphere Press for taking me on. Um, I, I am not represented and Atmosphere is a small independent publisher. And, um, and just as I'm grateful to Toadstool for, for buying a few books and carrying them in the bookstore, uh, finding, finding the right people along the way is just so critical. You, they say that writing is a, is a lonely um, endeavor, but I found that, that pulling people in to, toward, into your circle and, and um, leaning on them really um, is how I got to where I got to. So I don't know if that answered your question or not, Gail, but. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and just one more. Um, are there any writers whose work particularly inspired you for this book? So um, my favorite, my favorite um, 
uh, fiction author is Barbara Kingsolver. I've been, uh, and, and I know she writes some nonfiction as well, and, and I like her nonfiction, but, but um, her, her style of writing, it's lyrical and, and, um, and, it, and yet it's, while it's lyrical, it's also um, very clear and, and concise. I, I really like the way she writes. Um, uh, and so she's probably my primary influence. I wasn't thinking about a particular author and style of writing as I wrote this book, um, but but certainly reading reading her works were, was inspirational to me. Peter, I have a question. Sure, Don. Don. As as another writer of music and lyrics. I find it hard to decide whether I should keep a line that I've written or replace it. So when you write, how do you know what you've written is what you want to keep or whether it needs to be edited to better express what you're trying to say? That, that's a great question, Don. Uh, um, I, I don't think you actually one actually knows the answer to that question. Um, it's almost like you could you could edit endlessly, I think, um, and just try to keep improving and improving on on um, a phrase or a, a, a sentence or a paragraph. I think at some point you've just got to move on. You do the best you can, and then you employ the help of editors who can go through and critique and um, uh, offer you their insights. There's um, an author whose name I can't remember right now who who um, says you have to be willing to, to kill your babies. <laughs> uh, I think it might be Anne Lamott who said that um, when you're a writer and, um, and while in addition to killing babies in this story, uh, she, what she means is that you need to be willing to, to let go of something that you're really attached to. So you may have this tremendous turn of phrase or you may have this incredible character that you've developed or uh, a, a subplot line that, that you just have really loved to write and yet it may not serve the, the work itself and you have to be able to let it go. So I think that um, being able to listen to critique and, and um, other people's input is really important. And, um, and then there are those times when you just say, no, I'm not gonna, I love that, I love that um, paragraph and I'm, I'm happy with it and I'm gonna go with it. So it is, a, it is challenging because you do get attached to, to the work for sure. Let's see, there's somebody in the chat. Oh, let's see. Oh, okay. Don, Don wrote that in the chat too. So um, anything else, Mary, Don, Gail, anything you might be curious about? Have you uh, started thinking about your next book? I'll tell you, I have been thinking about it. Thank you, Mary. Um, and so one of, the, one of the effects for me of the pandemic has been that um, I've been, I found it very hard to, to be creative. I haven't written any poetry in the past 18 months and I've written about five chapters of what might become another book, um, but not beyond that. And um, I've talked to a lot of people who have who have shared their experience that either they, they aren't able to concentrate like they used to be able to, they can't read, sit down and read a book. Or um, I know a musician who, who told me he hasn't picked up his guitar in 18 months. So I think that, that um, one of the impacts of the pandemic has been to kind of um, uh, rob people, uh, some people of their creativity. And, um, and I'm experiencing that. I think at some point it'll come back. Uh, I hope it will. And I do have, I have ideas for a few more stories that I hope um, could turn into books as well. So we'll have to wait and see. I, I mean, I, I, as I say, I have about five or six chapters of, a, of another work that I've written. I'm not real excited about it yet, but I think I could probably get there eventually. Well, it's been great having you here. And for those who watch this later, thank you for, for watching uh, this presentation. I hope again, you will support your independent booksellers and particularly Toadstool Bookshop. And thank you, Grace, and thank you, Toadstool for this great opportunity.
Thanks very much. And just so everyone knows, we do have some copies of Peter's book available in the store. All right. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night.